The medieval times are not known for their cleanliness. With almost no concept of sanitation, this place was replete with germs. And with great germs come great disease. People back then had no idea how to treat ailments and medicine was basically just a guessing game. But by pure luck, some treatments worked. From leeches to skull knitting. Here are the weirdest medieval medical treatments that actually worked. Number 10. I love gold. Eating gold is a practice that dates back to ancient Egypt and was still popular with royals and nobles in Europe throughout the medieval era. The Egyptian records referred to this as a magic process called Ormus. The original treatment was ingesting monoatomic gold, a rare version of the expensive metal, and its health benefits are still being researched today. It's known that the body naturally contains a small amount of monoatomic gold. This metal plays an essential role in our health. Without it, we couldn't send electrical signals between our organs. The benefits of eating gold are up for debate, but one thing is certain. Squeezing out a golden number two is totally baller. We're intrigued by the legend of Ormus, as were those who could afford the stuff after knights came back with the new fad during the Crusades. The supposed treatment benefits for those interested are rapidly regenerating body cells, improved vital organ function, and rejuvenation of DNA telomeres. Pop quiz, hot shot! The Black Plague is the most notorious of medieval diseases. It wiped out an estimated 200 million people across Eurasia. But how did it spread so far and wide? See if you can guess the correct answer in the comments below, and I'll feature the first person to get it right in the next video. Number 9. Leeches and bloodletting are some of the more gruesome and stupid sounding of all the practices that doctors used to do. But it was actually one of the main go-to moves when a medical practitioner was presented with a sick person. They'd just drain out their blood. Makes sense to me. At the time, it was considered to be a <clears throat> scientific way of getting out the evil spirits that were believed to be making you sick. But leech bloodletting actually did work at times. The applications were for stuff like dental rot, abnormal nervous system problems, infection, and other skin problems. And there are many reported successes. Leeches are actually still used in some hospitals today for very specific treatments. Oddly enough, the leeches today are mainly used for plastic surgery. The reason your hospital probably still has leeches in a closet somewhere is because of the protein peptides they secrete, which prevent blood clotting. That's nice and all, but hopefully we can figure out a substitute sometime soon. Number 8. Bald's Eye Solve is a real old-timey combination of random ingredients like wine, garlic, and some animal parts. Garlic is still used as a home cure-all, so there you already have something tried and tested. For our pink-eyed ancestors, Bald Eye Solve was applied directly on the eye with a feather. The thing about this old concoction is it's been tested by modern researchers and has actually been found to have antibacterial properties. And some still use it in certain situations as a home remedy for when things get dirty on one of your two peepers. Number 7. Watercress is familiar still to every Englishman who's had a cress and egg sandwich. It's a little green and edible plant that you can grow in your garden. And interesting dental records revealed that the watercress was chewed on in an effort to save teeth from rotting out in a time way before cavity drills. It's not all too convincing that chewing on a little cress would actually save your teeth, but it doesn't hurt to brush them with crest. And that's actually how that company got its name, which is a fun fact that I just made up. <laughs> the vitamin C in Cress did help people with scurvy. And a scurvy mate is actually at risk of losing their teeth. So this old cure kind of worked. It's more of a better than nothing situation for ye old scurvy dogs. Before we move on, be sure to subscribe. Hit the bell button to get notified of new videos. And we always appreciate a big thumbs up. Number 6. 
Cauterizing a wound sounds incredibly painful, but it used to be your only chance to live when you had a real big boo-boo. You'd have to burn it shut with a hot piece of iron. You can imagine how painful that is, but it actually works. And it still does today if you're in a pinch. Cauterization seems to be a pretty popular go-to on screen right now in just about all period piece series and video games because it's accurate and shows how much grit it took to survive in the Dark Ages. It's dangerous though, riskier than it's made out to be in fiction. People can die from the burn damage alone, but for over a thousand years, for many civilizations, it was the only way known to save a person's life from serious flesh wound without proper equipment. Kinda makes you glad to be alive today. Number five. In England and several other countries, archaeologists dug up books with recipes and reference to a weird mixture called the whale. It's a potent concoction that was used as a painkiller and anesthetic for primitive surgeries. It contains a strong mix of poisonous substances including hemlock, henbane, and the old milk of the poppy. All of these, especially the first two, are lethal in just moderate amounts. One manuscript said this potion would put a man under for three to four days. Unlike modern anesthetics, it would basically poison the patient unconscious just short of death so that doctors could perform procedures such as amputation. It's even stronger in a sense than propofol, the drug that killed Michael Jackson. You'll never catch me taking dwell, but it did work if the patient ever woke up that is. Number four, the advancement to suturing wounds was a big leap for medicine back in the Middle Ages, and some surgeons took that a step further by successfully knitting broken skulls back together. They called it skull knitting, and it's a lot like it sounds. There are natural grooves in the skull, and when they're fractured, it's obviously a pretty big deal. To be able to knit a skull back together is super impressive because skull fractures, even today, can be lights out. The reason it works is because a skull can fuse itself back together in the healing process. That is, as long as you've put everything back precisely in the right place. It's assumed that only wealthy people of the time would be able to afford this kind of attention, but achieving skull fusion was an important step towards modern medicine. Number three, in Sutra, Scotland, archeologists found evidence for use of a medieval diet pill. <laughs> it's an herb we've mostly forgotten called bitter vetch or Lathrus linifolius. We've always have had the haves and the have nots. And at the time, the haves were fat and the have-nots were starving. Those nobles who wanted to trim off a few pounds would take this herb to curb their appetite like a modern diet pill. On the other side of things, it was also used by peasants in the droughts to survive meager weeks by suppressing their appetites when there was nothing to eat. Talk about having different problems. I wouldn't be surprised if this precipitated a peasant revolt or two. Number two. Snake oil is synonymous with quack sales of fake cures like Dr. Oz. But at the beginning, it was serious business for mild problems. Natural properties like omega fatty acids would help with inflammation and conditions like arthritis. Dating back to ancient China, snake oil was and is one of the many animal products they use for perceived health benefits. Through the centuries, snake oil reached the West and gained peak popularity around the 1800s. At that later point, snake oil never really worked for the intended purpose, which could be just about anything. Any medical benefit would usually be induced by the placebo effect. When you take the snake oil, you're definitely going to feel something. The user then believes it's working to the point that it really does work. Snake oils are made from the venom of snakes that are then dissolved into liquor with a range of strong additives like ginseng and later morphine and cocaine. So you're definitely gonna feel some effect. And the idea is sort of correct. Life-saving antivenoms are made out of the snake's venom itself. 
They're not anti-venoms, but the original use of snake oils was really just to put some hair on your chest and make you feel invigorated from the body's tolerance to that nasty venom juice. It's answer time. According to Britannica, the primary culprit for the widespread proliferation of the Black Plague was the Oriental Rat Flea. These little jerks are fleas that carry the virulent disease on their bodies, and they hop the ride on rats from inland Asia along the Silk Road and into Europe. The plague peaked between 1347 and 1351 and is estimated to have taken out 30 to 60% of Europe's population. Number one. One of the first and most impressive leaps to modern science came down to some actual surgery that had been performed since the medieval days. It's cataract removal. Cataracts are caused by a buildup of proteins in your corneas that make your vision go cloudy and eventually make you blind. Medieval doctors could remove cataracts with a sharp blade and precision, which I think was a pretty bold move to try in the first place, but also impressive for the time that they could successfully do this. And what adds another layer of impressiveness is considering that the person typically doing the eye surgery would be your barber. Uh, just a little off the top, please. 